do my stuff. Yeah, check it out, Chee Chee. Ooh, is that a dirty song? I know some terrible, terrible lyrics to that, and I'm just certainly glad that people have enough sense and good taste not to allow me to sing. Because uh, given free reign, there's no telling what I do. Oh, we're on the air? Hello, gang. Hey, <laughs> it's Uncle Wiggly. These poor fools. Uh, we'll uh, uh, bring it up there, big. There you go. Cha cha cha. The following program does not necessarily represent the sentiments or the philosophy of the station involved. You doggone well betcha. <laughs> you should know the truth. Oh, wow. Straight up. What a silly way to earn a living. have guys like Ian Carmichael in them, Terry Thomas, and, uh, you know, crime has always been a big thing in England, and uh, eccentric crime, and, uh, maybe. and uh, here's a little note from the London Times that just occurred, market butchers wielding joints of meat chased bandits through a maze of London back alleys yesterday after a mail van ambush. The bandits escaped with four mailbags containing about 7,000 pounds. That's about 15,000 bucks. They left behind two post office employees that were tied up. The raid took place in Bartholomew's Close, a cobbled cul-de-sac near Smithfield Market. Can you see the scene? Near Smithfield Market, as the mail van drew up beside a post office engineering depot, two men leaped from the rear of a waiting van and attacked the guard and driver with an iron bar. Butchers, seeing the event take place, ran from the wholesale stores. The boys just grabbed what they could and gave chase, waving joints of meat, said Mr. Terry McNamara, age 23. We chased them down a back alley, but the boys escaped. The gang escaped in a blue Ford transit van, abandoning their ambush vehicle. Leading the butchers was Mr. Dennis Plowman, age 27. Oh, I I follow a man wearing a mask down a highway. He turned and pulled a shotgun from a bag he was carrying. Ah, he leveled at me. I ducked at a doorway, and then I threw my ham at him. I hit him, but he got away. That's always a trouble to get away every time. That's the trouble. Life can be good, friends. It can be rich and full. All together now. Set that in there. I'm just saluting those guys. I don't, I don't know whether I was on the side of the guys with the with the with the ham hocks 
Well, the guys that uh, busted the mail van open. Actually, I, I think in this case I had to be for the... Did I ever tell you about the time that I observed the robbery? I'll tell you. In actual... No, I'm going to tell you a story now. This is, this is a story that happened in the city of Philadelphia. Now, uh, we all know that there's no such name. That's a silly name. No city would actually be called that. That's a that's a pen name that I've taken for the city. If, if it uh, it happened in Philadelphia, actually, and I'm uh, I'm walking along now. Now, most people to to most people, crime is a thing they see in the movies, and it's kind of fun. It's always played by. Uh, Oh, uh, Charles, uh, oh, what's his name? Oh, Lee Marvin is always involved in this kind of stuff. And it makes it kind of fun. You know, you shoot people and everybody laughs and a big kick out of it. Uh, Coburn, isn't that his name? He's always doing this stuff too. And, uh, and, and so naturally crime is kind of a fun thing. If you see enough movies, you know, it's a very, everybody sort of relates to the criminal, you know. Oh, sure. You know, but who, who likes Humphrey Bogart movies where he's straight? I mean, where he's a good guy, you know. He, he played a lot of good guys. They don't talk much about that. They always like the, you know, the Humphrey Bogart that has got that hat pulled down over one eye and he's got a Roscoe under his left arm. You know, this is, this is the real Bogart. And so, uh, that's because most people never have seen crime. <laughs> they, it's, they only see it in the movies or they, they, uh, read about it in books. It's like spying, uh, you know, so, by the way, I, I, uh, I'm gonna have to tell you something they probably won't like. Some terrible, that, that I know you're not gonna like. But, uh, you know, the myth around that, uh, the spy that came in out of the cold is the way spies really are. You know how people always said that? Forget it. Forget it. As a matter of fact, uh, I happen to know, and someday I'll tell you about it, I haven't even told you, I happen to know a guy who spent seven years in international secret service operations. And one of the funniest books he ever read was The Spy That Came In Out of the Cold. He said it was about as close to the way it really is as, let's say, uh, The Wizard of Oz is to uh, Charles de Gaulle. Well, there's a little parallel, but not much. <laughs> and and, and uh, I guess the reason that people always thought that was really the way spying really was was because the only spying that they'd ever read in books up to that time was the James Bond type, which, of course, was pure burlesque. Uh, curiously enough, and this is going to come as another shock to you, the James Bond world is much closer to the way spying really is than the Jean Le Carre world. Or is it Jean Le Carre? Huh? That's a terrible thing to tell you, too. Because you... <laughs> it is, really. So, uh, anyway, uh, you never know who's telling the truth, you know. Uh, but I'll tell you the story. This is a scary thing that happened to me. Before we do this, though, we got to get some business out of the way. we got to clear it all out of the way. Hit the uh, beer button there, please, if you will, old man. Oh, this is a good one. Oh, it's such an exciting commercial. Sing it out there, baby. Let's hear it. Sing it out, honey. Oh, no, this she sings. No, not on this one. Uh -huh. Thank God. Yes, sir, friends, you all in favor of having a party? Uh-huh. Well, when you're going to have a party, all you got to holler is, Miller High Life! And you've got a party going. Miller High Life is the life of the party. You thought old Charlie was? Forget it. Charlie's nothing without a belt full of Miller High Life. You give him a skin full of this stuff, man, and he goes. It's the hearty, distinctful flavor that makes it happen, makes any party come to life, even you. And the sparkling lightness of Miller High Life is always a friend. <laughs> yes, indeed. So when you plan the party, plan to serve Miller High Life right there on top of everything. The life of the party, the champagne of bottled beer. If you want to turn Charlie on, you give him a snoop full of Miller High Life. Da -da -da -da. Yes, sir. What's your good taste? <laughs> Oh, oh, yes, yes. I'm sorry. I got a little bit of a book. Why not? Aren't you? Oh, I'll tell you the story about this now. In crime, first of all, if you're ever around where it happens, a crime seems to have a random quality about it. It rarely looks like what it seems to be or what it is. 
Uh, everything is so neat and clean in, in the movies. You know, the bad guys come rushing out of their car, and they look bad. I mean, you are, you know that they're not just coming into Fred's used car lot to look used cars over. They look skulking. It's always Peter Falk and that crowd. I mean, who could trust that gang anyway? You know, put the, the whole crowd in a slam right down from the start, just from the way they look. And uh, so criminals really, uh, the, <laughs> the real thing, uh, on two occasions I have been in close proximity to loaded shooting irons. Hmm. Well, I'm talking, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not counting any military operations that I may or may not have been involved in. I'm talking about, you know, the random violence kind of thing. The, uh, the, the crime kind of thing. I, I don't know how the movies would have treated this first one. But I was, I was partnered to a surreal scene, which, uh, the minute I read this thing about the, the butchers running down the street, uh, throwing hams at these guys, <laughs> I was, uh, can you imagine those four thugs later? They're in their hideout, you know, and one guy's got a big bump on the back of his head where he got about seven lamb chops, and, and uh, <laughs> they're sitting there. <laughs> and, and, and one guy says to the other, he says, Blimey, what was that? You know, who, who are them nuts throwing them hams at us? What no? And, and somebody says, well, you know, they're trying to give the police new weapons here. And uh, you never know. You know, the British are, are severely hamstrung, if I may <laughs> use a bad. The British police are terribly hamstrung, and they're going after the criminals. Because, you see, according to British crime law, it's okay for, for the mobs to carry guns, but not the police. So that presents a little problem there when there's a gun battle. Now, speaking of problems, this is WOR, friends, speaking of crime. And, uh, and we're here in Fun City, and uh, right now at this moment... I, uh, I imagine a half dozen guys listening to the show right at this minute now are unaware that somebody is steeding the hubcaps off their car. <laughs> Take a look out the window, friend. In fact, it's gotten so widespread, did you notice now, that they even use it in commercials. That, uh, you know, so many cars are stolen these days. Oh, yeah, did you, did you hear, did you hear uh, the, the, the news note on the air here yesterday? About how many cars are stolen out of, you know, real parking places where you go and you pay the guy four dollars to keep your car for an hour in Midtown. And they have, a, they, st- you know, cars are stolen out of these places. And they were, they were interviewing the people about it. And they said, well, it's all the public's fault. Mm-hmm. Good old public. You did it again. Of course, it was, <laughs> uh, of course, uh, that, this is a, it, this is a, a I, I think probably more, uh, indicative of a general mood or trend in our time than any other mood or trend, that when in doubt, blame society. And then if that doesn't work, the police. <laughs> After that, uh, you become a flower people. Um, but uh, certainly never blame yourself or anything. I mean, never never take any responsibility. But uh, uh, oh, well, before we go any further, again, I must say this is W.O.R., that's a special announcement note. Let's blow my horn here. Special announcement note. There will be. Listen carefully. There will be. <laughs> I knew that would throw. <laughs> I love to make these noises. You know, I can just see these little Japanese transistor radios flying out of guys' hands all over. You know, <laughs> with the little thing in the ear. Uh, special announcement note. All right, got him again. A uh, special announcement. There will be no live limelight show this coming week, tonight, next week, this week. There will be no live limelight show this Saturday. All right, you got it straight, old chef? Yeah. No live, and we repeat, no live limelight show this coming Saturday. Why? Well, none of your business. I don't ask you nothing. You ain't got no right to ask me nothing, okay, man? Let's leave it at that. There will be no live limelight show this week. So, carry on. Okay? All right. Now, let's get back to our real life. Oh, did I tell you the, the scene that I had the other night? I go into this uh, this bookshop on 8th Street, right in the heart of the village, saying there's this guy, uh, he was heavily influenced by bad biblical art in his uh, contemporary makeup. You know the, you know the, uh, you, you remember those little cards they used to give you at Sunday school? Take a little card, and it would, it would illustrate, uh, uh, a, a lesson from the Bible. 
And all these guys were very skinny and had long hair that hung down to their waist. And they had these little pointed beards and their eyeballs rolled up all the time. You remember those guys? Uh, and they had very pink cheeks. You remember them? And uh, they wore these long pink robes and stuff. Well, this guy dresses exactly like that. And uh, he's been heavily influenced by Bible lesson cards. And he's in charge of the cash register in this bookshop. And uh, he's one of those kind of booksellers, you know. When you go in, you always feel like he invented Kierkegaard. And, uh, you know, Schopenhauer, he's already put down years ago. Because Schopenhauer, you know, never matured. And uh, this guy's got bells around his neck and that whole jazz. And so he's standing by the cash register. And there's a whole pile of my book there, you know. And God, we trust all of us pay cash. And next to it is... Uh, Giles, Gold Boy, and, and uh, you know, all this other, you know, deep literature. So I come up to him, very deep, and I come up to him and I says, uh, see, uh, I, I, I faked him out, see. Uh, what I did, I, I uh, faked him out by uh, by buying James Joyce's analysis of Kafka's analysis of Schopenhauer. And uh, that faked him out with a forward by Norman Mailer and Woody Allen. So, uh, I, I bought this thing, so you have to carry it. It's a secret book, and, and uh, he gave it to me from under the counter. And uh, then I pointed to my book and said with a sneer, I said, how is that selling? And he says, yeah, good, good, man. I says, have you read it? I don't read no religious stuff. That's what he said. And there he was. Now, I couldn't tell whether he was St. Peter or whether he was playing St. Paul, or whether he was playing one of the really central figures. I thought perhaps he was... I, I, You know, I figured if I waited around long enough, he would hurl a few lightning bolts, you know, or, or make 8th Street part, you know, with the waves. <laughs> I couldn't figure it out. And so I went reeling out into the night, and I realized that once again, literature weaves a subtle web of magic around man's innermost recesses of the darkest corners of his inner being. Let's hear that inner being music, man. Uh, we're, we're saluting the inner being. Troops get back in the formation there, Sergeant. While we prepare the roster here, uh, and get you guys on the stick. Anybody out there for for uh, the grease trap tonight? Anybody out there needs his medical forms filled out again? Anybody needs his shots renewed here? Huh? But uh, oh, you want to hear about the crime that I observed? You thought I wouldn't get back to it? Huh? All right. Yeah, it was one of those moments though that I realized how. Totally and completely abstract our idea, most people's idea is, about everything that he sees in movies and on television and uh, reads in books. It's Philadelphia. Got the picture? And it's uh, 6 o'clock at night. And it's on a Saturday night. I remember the event very clearly, very, I uh, remember almost every detail of it. Because these details are important. In Philadelphia, uh, on a Saturday night, uh, there is a great lull around supper time. Uh, nothing happens. Uh, you can hear off in the distance, you can hear the machinery beginning. This is the machinery that rolls up the sidewalks. And uh, you know, a few of the sidewalks have already gone in by 6 o'clock on a Saturday night. But uh, I was right in midtown. And I was walking along 16th Street, which uh, comes across Walnut, comes across Chestnut. And it's, uh, for those of you who don't know Philadelphia well, this is right in the heart of town. This is, uh, this was, would be the equivalent of, uh, oh, 
uh, coming along 47th Street, then you're just about to hit 7th Avenue. You're something like that. You're right in the middle of it all. Or maybe even Broadway. You know, you're right there. And I have just come back from having a little scoff. I've uh, knocked down a little chili. And uh, by the way, Philadelphia is a good town for chili. Um, wonder whatever happened there. Uh, it, uh, uh, another thing too, I, I had, what's the matter? I, it's, it's just one of those things, you know, what the heck. Now, I'm telling you, if it was Woody Allen, you'd have split a gut. Me, you say, shut up, knock it off. And so, I'm walking along 16th Street. Actually, I'll tell you what I did. I'd had a bowl of their, their fantastic terrapin soup. Yeah, they, they, they oh, seriously, uh, if you, if you go to, uh, Philadelphia and you don't have a bowl of that turtle soup, man, you are missing the whole town. I mean, you tell me all you want about Benjamin Franklin and, and William Penn. And now, those, you know, these old cats don't mean anything to me. When I'm sitting down in front of a bowl of turtle soup with a little, you know, a little sherry in it there. And so, I had this, this uh, big bowl of turtle soup, and I'm feeling very expansive. I'm walking along 16th Street, heading towards Walnut. Well, now, there's a lot of little shops all around this place, see. And the little kind of little child, photographic shop, little places over here. There's a couple of candy stores and uh, chic type places. You know, they're kind of nice, but they're little, see. And I'm walking along and, hey, tee, chee, 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 that, chee, 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 you know, it's a turtle soup. Dee, 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 don't, don't come and say to me, Shepard, you are in bad taste. I am merely describing life. Now, if you read it, if you read it in the book by Mailer or like by Baldwin, you'd say, what a magnificent grasp this man has of the realities of existence. And I'm walking along, and I'm, I'm completely in my own world. I've got my own thoughts going along. Whatever they were, uh, you know, inconsequential, little Christmas trees hopping up and down in my head, and birds fluttering, and the cloud goes by, you know. Uh, have you ever wondered how many times, how many hours of the day you walk around and nothing's happening in your skull? You know, you are a total half-mast. And, uh, you know, you're just walking around, your feet are working, and that's about it. And uh, your mind is just sort of floating around there like a cork in the Sargasso Sea. The weeds are all around there. And I'm walking along the street like this. And there was very little traffic, it's about 6 o'clock. I'm due to come back. Few people walking around about it. The shops were still open. That's important. A little few little shops there. And the street lights were all brightly lit all around me. And I'm I'm coming up to a, a little alley. This little alley goes in between these two big buildings. You know the kind of alley that the trucks go into to make deliveries in a little narrow alley, see, not the kind of cars go through anything, but a little narrow delivery type alley. And I'm walking along, and suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I am aware of a, of a, of a figure running across the street, coming directly at me. He's, I just come running, running at, he's running diagonally, and he's wearing a camel hair coat. Now I look, and this guy comes running along, he comes running, he runs directly in front of me. I would say not more than, no, six inches, he just runs, he runs through, and into the alley he goes. And I look down the alley, I see him running. He's about 10 feet into the alley now. And I, I, I look around. I said, what's, what's he running from? And I turn, and coming directly behind him, across the street, is a cop. He is running along, and he is pulling out his Roscoe as he runs. You know, he's unbuttoning his thing. His thing is coming. I see this instantly. See, and Well, my mind, as I said, was at half-mast. And uh, it did not grasp immediately the... Uh, uh, the circumstances that I was about to uh, be part of. Now, he's running right at me. Well, I look down the alley, and I see that the guy in the alley has now turned around. He's about 25 feet into the darkness of the alley, and he's got a Roscoe. Well, the cop, without further ado, goes kapow. Well, I'll tell you, uh, my mind ceased being that moment at half-mast. As an old ex-GI, I hit the ground. I'll tell you, I hit the ground. Now, I was on a concrete sidewalk. Well, by the time the second shot was fired, only the tips of my ears could have been seen by a passing bystander. I dug in that quick. And I'm flattened out, see. And I looked, I, I, I'm lying flat, see. And I can see the guy in the alley, and here's the cop. He's standing right next to me to my, he's to my left, you see. 
and the other guy is to my right, and they are firing right over my head. Pow, pow. And the guy in the alley is shooting at the cop. The cop is in the middle of the, the sidewalk directly to my left, and he is down now on one knee, and he is firing away. And they are both firing these great big fat blue, and I'll tell you, I saw both the weapons. I would say that the cop was firing a, uh, a service 38. You've seen the police 38. I would estimate that the man in the alley was firing a Smith and Weston, I would say a 44 Magnum. It was a lot of gun. And it was going, I'd see this big flash of red fire, you know, and the cop is firing away. And these guys are not more than 20 or 30 feet apart. And they're blasting at each other. I mean, there must have been, oh, about four or five shots fired. Now there's five or six, and I'm down on the ground, the shaking with the shots. And the cop was hollering, and the guy in the alley was sort of skulking back. And the reason he was skulking was because I saw now for the first time that the alley was almost completely blocked by a truck, which had pulled in there and was went from one wall to the other, practically, in this alley. And these two guys were blasting away. And there I am, I'm laying on the ground. <laughs> oh, a pow! Whee! Pow! Woo! I, and I hear these bullets ricocheting off the buildings, you know. And, and it was like, you know, do you remember Sergeant Preston of the Royal Mounted? And his great dog, King? And, uh, yeah, it was that, that kind of a scene. You know how they used to open up the show all the time? You'd hear, boom! Woo! You'd hear the ricocheting of a bullet. Well, I don't know what all that ricocheting was in the frozen Arctic wastes, but there was plenty of ricocheting on 16th Street, and I'd hear those slurs. They go, pow, pow, and the cop is taking deliberate aim, and this guy is popping away, when suddenly I become aware of a figure to my left, another figure. It is a lady. A short, stocky lady wearing one of those short, stocky lady black coats, you know, with the little fur around the neck. She's got this little hat that looks like a pot, you know, with a geranium sticking out of the top of it. And she's got a net shopping bag that's full of bones or something, you know. And she's walking along there. And I see this lady, and she's walking right up to the cop. And I holler, lady, lady, watch it, get down, look out. Wow, oh, another big shot goes roaring off, you know. And these guys are shooting back. I say, lady, lady, look out, they're shooting. Well, now she is directly next to the cop and looking down the alley at the guy that's plugging away. I says, lady, for right out loud, look out. Pow, oh, and the cop, he doesn't know what's going on. He's firing away. He doesn't even see her. See, with that, she turns to me and she says, oh, it's all right. They're not shooting at me. Would you please bring me a little of that music on again? She says, it's all right. They're not shooting at me. Well, with that, the guy in the camel hair coat, obviously beginning to think now that the cop has got reinforcements, he turned and he worked his way between the wall and the truck. The cop ran into the alley, and for at least five minutes, way down the alley, I could hear echoing shots. I am lying on the ground now, and all around me are spent 38 cartridges. Across the street, there are four broken windows. There are people hanging out, you know, their faces white. Now, one lady, I remember, looked out, and she had a hair dryer on the top of her head, you know, with a hole through it. And we're all, you know, everybody's stunned. And I looked up at that lady, and I said, lady, they, you almost got killed. And she looks at me like as if I was the biggest stoop in creation. She says, what do you mean? I haven't done anything. They weren't shooting at me. And in she goes into the photography store, so calm, and I doubt whether she even saw what happened. Oh, Hindu. Oh, you big old Hindu stand. Well, well... I was shaken. Now you want to hear the aftermath of this story? I was shaken to the core. And uh, I go up to the radio station where I was working at the time, KYW by name, and uh, I goes up to the station. I tell all the guys up at the station about this, you know, the newsroom, and immediately they're contacting the police and the whole shtick, you know, about the, this uh, robbery. By the way, what, what happened? There was a robbery across the street, and this guy... The policeman happened by and just saw the robbery as it happened. 
and uh, the the uh, the robber had shot his way out of this candy store, whatever it is he was holding up, and that's how the whole thing started. He ran across the street there. I was in the middle of it all. See, well, that night I was on the air. See, I couldn't believe the scene. What got me was not so much the shooting. I'd seen a little shooting before. But this lady standing next to the cop saying, it's all right, they're not shooting at me. She knew she was one of the good people. And she also knew that good people never get shot in films. If they do, it's a little nick, you know, in the arm, something like that. That's kind of nice. You tell your grandchildren about it. Uh, you don't really get shot. And uh, so I, I'm on the air, and I'm telling this story. I told this story on the air, just the way I told it to you now. Well, by George, about five minutes after I got off, there's a phone call into the station, and there's this very distinguished type guy on the phone. And he says, he says, could you give me any further? He says, was she wearing, he says, did she have on a pair of brown shoes that had buttons up the side? I says, you bet. I was right down there where they were, them shoes. He says, then, he says, I can't believe it. She was telling the truth. And I says, what do you mean? He says, that's my mother. I says, your mother? He says, yeah, she's been home here making the red cabbage and the meatloaf, and she's been telling us about how she saw these two guys shooting away, and she's watching the shooting, and she says, some nut yelled at her to get out of the way, and she knew she hadn't done it, they weren't going to hit her. He says, we thought she had finally flipped her cork. He says, nobody believed the old lady. <laughs> I says, no kidding. He says, yeah, that was my mother. He says, she went right into the photographic station. She was going to pick up some pictures. Uh, to bring him home. He says, we had some Kodachrome slides. He says, hey, Ma! Ma! Hey, Ma, we believe you now. Yeah, the guy from the radio's here. Yeah, he saw it. Yeah. And then I heard this voice. He says, hello, Sonny. I said, hello, madam. Yes, hello. And I said, uh, boy, you know, I was lying on the ground there, and I, I, I was afraid you were going to get shot. Well, what for? I said, well, they were shooting. What they... they I haven't. Uh, why should they shoot me? I said, I don't know, ma'am. I said, no idea. I'm just glad they didn't. I said, well, thank you very much. I... And you know, I did. That was a very important lesson to me. That I, I, I wonder how real the things that people see in movies really are to them. You know, one time I saw a, a, a suggestion by a film critic. And they were talking about, uh, you know, violence in films and on TV shows. And this film critic said, look, I know the best way to stop violence completely. I mean, on TV shows and, and movies and stuff. And that is, have a rule that requires violence to be shown the way it really is. I mean, if you've ever seen a guy get shot with a forty-four, man. Oh, you'll never forget it. And, and I've always, I've watched, for example, I saw a, 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 a film here a couple of months ago where one guy shot another guy with a submachine gun. And he just, ah, yeah, yeah, the, the dirty dozen type thing, ah, and uh, down they go and they fly up against the wall. Oh, man. If you've ever seen a guy actually get 45 slugs out of a Thompson submachine gun cut not only in half, but in the quarters, and then cutting the smaller pieces, and then distributed around as hors d'oeuvres. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. You have another idea of what it's all about. Well, that old lady, probably to this day, is uh, telling her friends about how the time she saw that nice policeman uh, shooting at that bad man, and that uh, she was right there. Well, I had one other experience like this, which I... I uh, I, I never once, I never heard, never even heard the end of it. I am driving along a road, and it's the outer drive in Chicago. It's Sunday. I've got a date. It's like, uh, you know, driving along, uh, uh, driving along the Merritt Parkway, you know, on a date. It's so beautiful until the sun is up. And, and it was about two in the afternoon. We were on our way to the museum or some jazzy thing like that. You know, the sun is up, and I've got my old man's car, and, and the, the chick is sitting next to me, and we're driving along in the Sunday traffic, and all the ladies with the hats, with the flowers, and all that, they're all going to see Grandma and all that stuff. We're driving along. It's a big one-way road, you see. There's a lot of traffic on it, and uh, it's one way. There's no no two-way cars going. 
when all of a sudden I see in the rearview mirror, I see this car. He's tailgating me. He's right on my back. See, and he goes, "Wow!" He pulls out and he goes, "Whoa!" He goes tearing through that traffic about forty-five miles an hour faster than anybody else. And I said, "Oh, look at that nut!" And suddenly, uh, the, another car goes whistling past me directly behind him. I couldn't believe what I'm seeing. These two cars, and they're chasing each other. And I see sticking out of the rear window of the car in the back, I see an arm. He went right past the door of my car. The arm went right past the driver's side, see? I see this big arm, and this guy has got in his hand one of the biggest Roscoe's I had ever seen in my life. Well, he is now right opposite the hood of my car. He has pulled past me. He is right directly at my left front quarter, and suddenly he fires the first shot. He goes, boom, and there's a great big roar. I see the big smoke fly, pow, it goes. And I see the car ahead. I see a guy, he hits the back window with the butt of a gun. The back window goes out, and out comes this hand. And he goes, pow, this one is firing at me. You know, they're all going... There they go. These two cars are firing at each other, going right down the middle lane of a Sunday afternoon drive traffic in Chicago on the outer drive. Well, they disappear about five cars ahead. And, of course, half of the cars around me didn't even know what was going on. It just happened right next to me, so I saw it. And I'm, you know, I'm fascinated. I said, we let's go. Let's go watch, Dorothy. And she says, yes, wow. So I step on it. I go ahead. And I see now the two cars have pulled off. They have pulled off to the left. And next to the highway, along on the left, there was a high hedge and a low wire fence. One of these little fences, you know, made out of cable where they keep cars from uh, driving off. And these two cars have pulled up. And I arrived just in time to see one man run into the bushes. And the other guy who was doing the firing, there were three men in the second car, the, the, the gunman in the second car leap out and chase the first guy into the bushes, firing as he ran. Well, traffic moved us all on past. And I remember coming home and telling my father about the scene. And he says, no kidding. I says, yeah, they were shooting it out right down the outer drive. He's soppy doggone. Let's get the papers. Well, we read every paper we could lay our hands on. We must have read 17 Chicago papers, and it was not even mentioned. And then the old man, after reading all these papers, says, what are you trying to hand me? Is that, is that, is that how you're trying to get out of the idea that you bought the car home at two hours late? I said, no, no, I saw it. I actually saw it. They were shooting on the other drive. Well, that became a joke in our family. The time Jeannie went out with the car and saw the shooting on the outer drive and brought the Oldsmobile home two hours. And that was the cockamamie story he invented, to, you know, when he actually went into the woods with uh, Dorothy and they hang around, you know, and all that jazz, and they brought the camera. I never could convince anybody that I saw it. And what's even worse, half of the cars were driving along me. They, you know how people on Sunday, the, the real square Sunday driver who looks like he's half embalmed. There's three kids in the back and a fat wife in the front, and they're driving along, you know. His glasses are all clouded. He hasn't even washed his glasses for four months, you know. Nothing to see in his world. He's driving along. He never saw what was going on. And and that was the second, or the first, really, the first time that I saw gunfire. And that there was one other time, which I won't even mention this time. One, one... Yeah, all right, I got two minutes. You want to hear the, the other time that I saw the gunfire going up? Well, I, you remember the Philadelphia sniper that they made a movie about? Well, I, I came back one night to the, to the office. It was around, uh, uh, oh, maybe about two in the morning. And, uh, I parked my car in a parking lot. And I was walking down towards the office. I had some business in the place there. And all of a sudden, I hear his ping. I turned around. I saw nothing. I just heard this ping. It was a high, keening, a, a very uh, distinctive sound. 
And once you've heard, you, even if you haven't heard it, I suspect that people would recognize gunfire. It's instinctual. I hear ping. I look around. And that was all. I go up in the elevator and I uh, walk into the station, which was operating all night long. And I walked down the corridor, and one of the newsmen came out with a piece of yellow copy paper. He says, well, the sniper got another one. He was about ten minutes ago. I said, where? He said, gee, it's about two blocks down. I said, no kidding. <laughs> and I thought to myself, holy smokes, yeah. <laughs> that time I began to think, you know, and I saw myself briefly in this telescopic sight. You know, walking along, scratching and spitting with these two little crosshairs right crossed at my earmuffs. You know, la ta ta, la ta ta dee. And so you never know when you're going to see gunfire, friends. You never know. And that's the way it really works in life. It's random. It's just totally without, there's no plot, really. And I suppose that's what makes Lee Marvin's movie so cute. There's a plot, you know, and he's so lovable and cuddly and cute. And so you really... Uh, and, oh, yes, we have a tendency in our time to make violence sort of a, a fun, lovable thing. You know, the Bonnie and Clyde syndrome. Uh, have you noticed that, uh, that almost all gunmen today are played by cute, cuddly people? Oh, listen, let me tell you, the real... The guys that played gunmen in the movies, in the old, you know, the Class B movies you see late at night, now they wouldn't stand a chance in the movies anyway. But the guy with the blue jowls... And the little BBs for eyes. Remember those guys? By the way, that's the way gunmen really look. Uh, they wouldn't stand a chance in the movies now today. Uh, we go more for guys like Coburn. Isn't that his name? Coburn, the tall, skinny guy with all the teeth. Yeah. We go for guys like Lee Marvin, who makes, uh, you know, gunfighting so, such a fun thing. It's kind of fun. And the Warren Beatty and, and nice people like that. And Margaret, you know, they all pack rods and knock over a few things here and there. But uh, I suppose uh, that's all part of the scene. Just keep your knees loose. And I might say, uh, as an old, uh, you know, practitioner, uh, give them a low silhouette. Keep low. Uh, I, I could use the actual army phrase here, but the, a lot of little ladies wouldn't. You keep it, but just keep it down, will you, fella? Huh? Keep low. Don't forget, walk on your elbows. And keep moving. Give them a low silhouette and always move. Don't don't stop once because they shoot at the shadows. So long, gang. Uh, it'll be all right. Just think good thoughts. <laughs> uh,